So, um, everyone, thank you uh, yet again for showing up for Freak Day and for being, being willing you. to sit in this room and listen to me bitch about shit. Um, before I actually provide my... Uh, so, obviously, a lot of interesting things have happened over the past couple months that like what? Like what? are somewhat relevant to the comments that I may or may not have made at this conference over the long period of time that I have been speaking here. Uh, uh, but before I, I talk about those things, um, I, I have this other uh, uh, co uh, comment that I, I need to make. Um, uh, I, I, I need to uh, ask the audience for, no, I got one, man, but I'll, it's good to have a backup. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Um, so uh, I, I, I want to talk about something else. Um, so I think that, so Lawrence Lessig, uh, who created Creative Commons, uh, has started this group called Root Strikers. And root strikers basically, that their slogan is that for everyone hacking at the branches of evil, there are like you know very few that are striking at the root. Okay, and 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 his context for that observation is the idea that the root of the problem is that our democratic process is broken, that the politicians that we are electing are not necessarily responsive to the people anymore. And the, and the reason for that is that it's very expensive to run for office. If you're going to run for office, you have to raise money. Fortunately, it is not the case that there is a direct correlation between the amount of money that you spent and your probability of being elected. Uh, but there is some baseline that you have to reach in order to be a viable candidate, and that baseline is very high. Uh, and, and so in order to reach that, and unfortunately, there's sort of like a, an arms race thing where that baseline keeps going higher and higher. And so in order to reach that baseline, you have to go out and raise money from, from wealthy donors who are investing in controlling the government. Uh, and uh, you know, even when you get into office, you know, your first day, um, you know, you're picking up the phone to start raising money again for your next election or you're not gonna get reelected. Uh, and so you know, the reality is that that money has a huge influence on you know, what our political system consists of. And so you know, the question is, what can we do about that? And I think that, that um, we need to teach people uh, to try to evaluate, uh, um, you know, candidates on a more objective basis. And, and uh, um, you, you know, the, the reality is that there are uh, multiple candidates that might show up on your ballot, and you should look into that before you show up to vote. Uh, and you should spend some time researching all of those candidates so that you can make a decision about who you're going to vote for. And in order to do that, you need objective information resources, and you need to use that. So, uh, a couple of years ago um, at, at Freaklink, I started this thing called Wiki Voter Guide. I announced this thing here. Um, and Wiki Voter Guide uh, is uh, uh, basically, you can go to our website, you can put in your zip plus four, and we'll tell you who's running for office in your next election. Um, and then you can click on their names and get their Wikipedia profile. So people can use Wikipedia to document um, you know, different politicians running for office, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, and I think that you know, in spite of all of the drama around Wikipedia, that it actually does a good job providing factual information about things. So um, I, I think it is a good resource, and it's a resource that is not uh, controlled by a particular uh, person's agenda, um, uh, although it can be hijacked. Uh, and, and there's actually a sub, there's a, there's another piece of Wiki Voter Guide that has to do with uh, trying to pr uh, protect the users of Wikipedia from vandalism, but that's a. That's a long topic that I'm not going to get into, and it's also another talk I did at Freaknik a few years ago. Um, but um, anyway, the the uh, so I, I I don't know. Recent events have um, uh, caused me to be even more cynical and jaded about politics than I was originally, uh, and so um, and I'll talk about that. Um, but uh, you know, I still think that you know Wiki Voter Guide has some potential in terms of creating a resource that people can use to research uh, political elections and to retrain the way that people think. It's really about, you know, if we want a different kind of country, it's really about us, and it's it's not about the process. We have to change the way that we approach things, uh, we being everybody. Uh, and so, but we've got to find out what the right model is for people to follow, and we've got to provide a way for them to follow. So, um, so I'm, I'm running this thing, and I set it up as a 5013C public charity, uh, and you can actually, um, so in theory, if someone were to donate money to me, no one has ever done that, uh, they could write that donation off as a, as a tax deduction, and I have a tax ID number. Um, and I actually, um, um, uh, so here's the problem. In order to retain my, uh, my 5013C status, I have to raise a certain amount of money from the public. Uh, 
And I, I, I actually haven't bothered to do that because I'm funding everything and it's not very expensive for me to do what I'm doing. Um, but I, I have to if I'm going to retain that status and uh, that, that status could be important for, for things that I will continue to do in the future. So I know this is lame, but I'm going to sit around a collection cup. If you have a couple bucks and you understand Wiki Voter Guide and you're willing to continue to support my efforts, it would really be appreciated uh, because um, if I can tell the IRS that I am in fact raising money from the public, then they will continue to allow me to be a public charity. Um, and if you want to make a tax deductible donation and you want my EIN number, you can talk to me after the talk and I will give it to you. Um, yeah. Um, and your, let me explain what your money goes to. Your money goes to the hosting cost for Wiki Voter Guide. There's enough money. And some of it will also be donated to Project Vote Smart. Project Vote Smart is a very important nonprofit charity that, that uh, has a, uh, they, they hire a bunch of interns who actually go out and document people that are running for office in different districts all across the country. And they create a central database of all of this information about who's running for office. So it's a really great objective resource about who's running for office. And they had an endowment that they were operating under, and they gave all of it to Bernie Madoff. And so Bernie Madoff was running a pyramid scheme, and he lost all of the money that was being used to operate Project Votes. So they are in a bad financial position. Um, so, you know, a, a percentage of the money that I am collecting will go to Project Vote Smart. Any, any uh, additional money that we have above our expenses will go to Project Vote Smart, and Project Vote Smart is a very important resource. So, um, so anyway, that's my, that's my um, pre-remarks. There's a couple of people who put their hands up, so I'm going to stop for a second before I actually start ranting. Yeah, just really, really fast. Yeah. Uh, on your 501c3, yeah. like you're a public charity, you got to pass the two-thirds test uh, within the first five years. So that's more right. of your five years need to be uh, two-thirds from the public and one-third from you, or you'll become a private foundation. That's right. Just wanted to point that out to everybody. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. That's exactly right. And I'm. this is year four, I think. I hope it's not year five. I think it's yeah. year four. So I really got to get going on, on yeah. actually raising revenue for the public, and I'm not doing that yet. So yeah. uh, I really appreciate your help. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to do that, but, but I think that it is a potentially important project. And furthermore, if you really think it's interesting and you have time, Please talk to me because um, uh, I, I have done a fair amount of work on it, but uh, you know I, I uh, could really use help, particularly if you're a good web designer or you're interested in politics. So um, the, definitely the door is open for people who have time and are interested in working that project. So anyway, um, thank you very much for that. Um, I am now going to talk about, oh God, what is this? It's power. <laughs> Knowledge. Peaches. Peaches. Well <laughs> Pineapple flavor. Something else. <laughs> so it's got vitamin C in it. Probably. Sea turtle. Peach orgasm. <laughs> so somebody, that's delicious. Somebody was giving me shit earlier. Because um, I was on the USA Today at, uh, at Black Hat briefings, and I, and I got quoted talking about the fact that uh, General Alexander, who runs Cyber Command in the NSA, spoke at Black Hat. And I said that I was glad that he was there. Uh, and I got quoted on that in the USA Today. So people were, somebody was giving me hell about it. And so I want to start with that. Um, and, and of course, I gave a very long interview to the USA Today, and they only used a snippet. Uh, but I am glad that he was there. Um, I think that, you know, um, uh, you know notwithstanding, uh, um, you, you know, of course, there are people who have a point of view that, you know, we, we need a radically different kind of system than we currently have. Um, um, right now, I would simply be satisfied if we actually had the system that we supposedly have, okay? Um, and the system that we supposedly have involves things like having a military, and it involves things like having the NSA. The, obviously, we have to have the NSA under the context of the system that we currently have. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it makes sense that that organization exists, and it's good that those people are interested in being engaged with our community. Um, you know, back in the early days of this community, this community was considered a thorn in the side of everyone. Uh, you know, and we're all a bunch of criminal hackers, right? So, um, you know, establishment interests were not interested in engaging with us. We're not interested in recruiting from this community. Um, but I, I think that the community has matured significantly over the past 20 years. I think there's a lot of people in this community that are involved in computer security professionally and are often on the same side of, of the trenches, oh my, uh, as the, um, as the, you know, oh, uh, so a lot of these people in this community are on the same side of the trenches as, uh, the NSA, particularly with respect to things like cyber espionage. So, um, there's, there's, it's, it's good that, 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 that the NSA recognizes that and they're interested in engaging with this community and they want to have a good relationship. They want to have partnerships. Um, at the same time, I think that the establishment, although they recognize the value of this community, does not understand why this community is valuable. 
Uh, and I think this is really important. Um, and I, I, I think that there's been this, um, there's this constant thing that everyone brings up that if you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to hide. <laughs> okay. Right, which we, we laugh at that. Uh, but I don't know if we've done a, an effective job at, at discrediting that point of view. It keeps being brought up. People genuinely don't understand why that is a problem. Um, and I think that um, it relates to uh, the, the fact that the establishment doesn't understand why this community is valuable. This community is not valuable because people in this community are more technically skilled than people in other places. That is bullshit. Uh, if, uh, we, we have a university system in this country that produces PhDs who are extremely technically skilled. It is not simply a factor of technical skill. It is a matter of perspective. The people in this community are valuable because they are technically skilled, but more so because they look at the problem from a different point of view. Uh, and it is the coupling of technical skill with the ability to, to have a unique perspective that really creates value and really makes this, the things that come out of this community interesting and valuable to people like the NSA. So where does that, uh, th that perspective come from? And, and that perspective comes from um, our ability to stand outside of the norms of acceptable social behavior, frankly. Um, I tend to think of, so my favorite hacker is Steve Wozniak. I think he's someone who exemplifies everything that is great about this community. Um, and you know, so and Steve Wozniak is a prankster, and he likes to find a way to stand in a place that people don't think exists, just to see how they react. Uh, and I'll give you an example. He he would go to the print, the Bureau of Printing and Engraving, which is on the Mall in Washington D.C. You go there, and you can see them print money, and then you can buy these books of uncut bills of various denominations, including two-dollar bills. So you can buy a book with sheets of perforated, uncut $2 bills from these people at a significant premium over the face value. But being a millionaire, you can go and buy these books. Uh, and then he'll buy the book and then walk down the street to the McDonald's. And he'll go in and he'll order his lunch. And then he'll attempt to pay by providing sheets of uncut $2 bills <laughs> just to see how people react. And, you know, a normal person wouldn't have a thought to do something like that. Uh, um, what, what Steve Wozniak's talent is, is, is to identify things that he can do or places that he can be or things that he can be that people don't expect or don't think are possible. It's kind of like a magician. Uh, and, and, and in fact, sometimes it's just good for a laugh. But sometimes by standing in those places, you can see things that other people couldn't see that are incredibly important. And, and that's really what Steve Jobs has given the world. He's, by standing in these places, he's seen opportunities for innovation that have had a tremendous impact on the world that we, we've all experienced. And, and that's, I think, a large part of what we all try to do by participating in this community. We try to find those places where we can see the world from a different perspective. Now, th there are, um, so think about uh, social behavior. There's a line in the sand, right, between uh, what is socially acceptable behavior, what is normal behavior, and behavior that is not socially acceptable, behavior that is not normal, okay? Uh, so that's a line. There's also a line between behavior that is legal and behavior that is illegal, right? So that's a line. And then we also know that there's another line between behavior that is, that is uh, not malicious and behavior that is malicious, behavior that is inherently evil or bad, right? And we know that these three lines are in different places sometimes. So, uh, you, you know, obviously there's a desire to make them the same, but it's complicated. So often there is a distinction between behavior that is socially acceptable, behavior that is legal, and behavior that is uh, uh, malicious. All right, so to give you an example, uh, you know, uh, smoking marijuana is a great example. Smoking marijuana is not malicious. Smoking marijuana does not inherently harm people, but it is illegal. So it exists in the space between what is what is inherently malicious and what is what is illegal. Um, and it, so, um, you know, there are many things that might exist in the space between what is what is so they might be legal, but they might not be socially acceptable. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, being a homosexual is legal, fortunately, but it, it is not necessarily socially acceptable. Um, so, in society's desire 
to control or prevent malicious behavior. Um, often, this legality line is drawn in different places. Sometimes, behavior which is not inherently malicious is nonetheless illegal, uh, and it's illegal because society is trying to prevent people from doing things that are, that are harmful. Um, and in fact, society often has a hard time differentiating between behavior that they consider unacceptable, strange, or not normal, and behavior that they, that they want to, to control or prohibit out of their fear of things that are harmful or evil, okay? So if you, if you think about that structure, um, the reality is that someone like Steve Wozniak and many of the people in this community are people who live their lives in this space that is outside of what is normal or what is socially acceptable, but is hopeful often inside of what, what is legal and clearly inside of, of what, is, what is harmful or, or malicious. And so when you live life in that space, uh, you have a great deal to fear because um, society does not do a good job telling the difference between you and someone who is actually dangerous. Uh, and, and many of our uh, society's attempts to control uh, um, uh, you know, behavior that is threatening end up impacting everyone who is outside the world of what is socially acceptable. Civil liberties are the scaffolding that hold open this space. Okay, um, you have a democracy. In a democracy, the majority has the power to decide what policies they want, and the majority is going to prohibit everything that is socially unacceptable unless they're prevented from doing so. A, a, a civil liberty is a check against the power of the majority. It constrains the majority's ability to prohibit things that are not harmful but may be socially unacceptable. Consider the right to freedom of speech. The right to freedom of speech only comes into play when the majority wants to ban something. And the right to freedom of speech protects your rights to, to, to say that thing and to stand in that place that is socially unacceptable in spite of the fact that the majority wants to control it. That's the function of, of civil liberties. They create this space that hackers live in, that this community lives in, and that community, because of the unique perspective that comes from living in that space, is able to see opportunities for innovation that have a tremendous impact on our, uh, on our world, okay? Our, our ability to do what we do, the power of this community and the impact that it has comes from its perspective, which is a perspective that depends upon civil liberties for its existence. Um, and, and that's something that I, I don't think, and so the reality is that, that if we see civil liberties being removed, if we see the space between what is legal and what is socially acceptable beginning to close, um, what we find ourselves in is a position where our world is certainly threatened, um, and, and where we do have something to hide, and in fact, if our world is destroyed, there's a whole lot of value that gets eliminated with it. There are a whole lot of babies that got thrown out with that bathwater. So, since 9-11, we have had uh, a number of things happen that have changed the way that civil liberties function within our society. Before I continue, I am going to take a drink. And I, 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 wanna, I wanna make this an interactive discussion because I, I think that, that, I think that, you know, we all have something to process here with what we've been through over the past couple of months, but, you know, these are the things that came to my mind that, I, that concern me, that are new. Um, you know, U.S. citizens today detained without charge. Uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to, um uh, complicate the way you presented the space okay. of uh, socially acceptable, illegal, and malicious uh, to point out that there are activities that are definitely malicious that are not only legal but are also socially acceptable. That's a great like, point. Uh, yeah. Like overdraft fees Smoking. that banks charge, for example. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like so overdraft fees. I, I sort of set up a structure where this line's here, this line's here, and this line is here, but the fact is that these lines cross each other and and the and and Free all over the space. It's a Venn diagram, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, thank you for making that point. That's an excellent point. Um, and and um, 
So, U.S. citizens detained without charge. Um, some of these issues have been resolved, sort of. Some of them have not been resolved. Okay, uh, the U.S. Uh, government engaging in torture of, of uh, you know suspected terrorists, a due process free no fly list where someone can decide that you are not traveling anymore and you don't really have anything that you can say about that to fix it if you are not who they think you are. Uh, suspicion searches of electronics at border crossings. Um, it, you know, back in the 1970s, um, if the if you went across the border with sealed mail, they had to get a warrant to open it. Uh, but now, if you go across the border with your laptop, uh, they don't even need to establish a reason to suspect you before they uh, take the device away from you and send it for forensic analysis. Uh, uh, warrantless wiretapping, we had a debate about that. Uh, business record surveillance, we're now having a debate about that. Um, some of these issues sort of have been resolved. So U.S. citizens detained without charge. Um, um, so they, there's this guy, Jose Padilla, they, they detained him at, at um, Chicago O'Hare International Airport, not on a battlefield. Um, they detained him without charges for like four years, maybe six. Um, and uh, they went through this whole process where there were people challenging his detention and went through the whole court system, got up to the Supreme Court, and surprise, they moved him, so you're in the wrong jurisdiction. Uh, and so they went through the process again, and they got up to the Fourth Circuit Appellate Court, and the Fourth Circuit Appellate Court came up with this elaborate theory, which I, I kind of um, think of as the, I, it's, it's sort of the, um, it's, it's like a cartoon where, you know, there's a chase happening in a cartoon, and first they're flying airplanes, and then they're driving cars, and then they're, you know, running on foot. Um, you, you know, the idea is that, like, this guy was on the battlefield at some point, and so, you, you know, he could have been chased elaborately from the battlefield and ended up in Chicago O'Hare Airport where, where he was detained. That's not actually what happened, but that was the theory of the Fourth Circuit when they decided it was okay. That, that theory was going to go to the Supreme Court, uh, and the, the uh, Bush administration wisely decided not to have that reviewed by the Supreme Court because they were going to get their asses handed to them, and so they decided to go ahead and finally charge Jose to deal with a crime. Um, the, I hope that dude is guilty. Um, they, they, um, you know, his brain was more or less mush by the time he came out of detention, uh, and they convicted him on the basis of the fact that there was a piece of paper that he had signed that had his fingerprints on it. Which you know, I, I you know, if you're if you're uh, cynical, you might argue could have been passed to him at any point during his detention. Um, I, I again, you know, hopefully he's, he really is guilty because they they certainly um, they they certainly uh, you know detain him for forever. Um, what did they charge him with? Uh, I, I I guess so. He, that piece of paper was him signing up to join Al Qaeda. I guess that you would. It's kind of bizarre to think of them keeping paperwork for that, uh, but apparently they did. And so um, allegedly, like we we raided some uh, camp in Afghanistan and found this paperwork, and uh, and so he had signed up. And so so material support for a terrorist organization is what they charged. Um, so that, anyway, the, 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 the fundamental problem here is that this is a U.S. citizen on U.S. soil who is detained without charges. Uh, and, and in our system, you're supposed to have charges uh, uh, when you detain someone. And, and it, it's little comfort that six years later they eventually charged him with a crime. Uh, it means that they can detain you for at least six years uh, without, without charges. Now, there have been other rules. No, no other U.S. citizen, as far as I know, was detained without charges. Uh, so obviously, like, they have decided not to do that in general as a policy. Um, but it creates a somewhat uh, disconcerting precedent for the future, sir. Drone without charges? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was Just under eighteen, catch, catch U.S. citizen. That's an excellent point. I said, what else? Can you hold that thought? I'll get there. Sure. So there's torture. Um, so Obama, Obama clearly ran on a platform of I'm going to change some of the things that are happening around here, right? <laughs> 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 I'm glad no yes, I'll be here all week. Um, so, the, so, so he argues that he has stopped the U.S. from torturing detainees, which he might have done. Um, I don't know if they have any detainees they want to torture right now, so maybe it's easy to do that. I don't know. Um, but, uh, you know, always wanted to torture hopefully that issue has been resolved. Um, due process free no fly list still exists. If somebody doesn't like you, they can put you on the no fly list, and you're more or less fucked. You can argue there. There is a whole group of people who have a class action lawsuit about this, and they're all 
You know, I'm, I'm such and such, I'm filing this lawsuit. If I was part of Al Qaeda, I probably wouldn't be doing that. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, you know the, they're, they're gonna have to go through the whole process in order to get some adjudication of this. So, we, we, you know, the US government can essentially prevent you from traveling without due process of law. Yes? Uh, and that no-fly list is uh, filtering down into other areas. I think it's New Jersey that recently passed a law saying that if you're on the no-fly list, you can't legally buy a gun. Oh yeah, yeah, right, right. So it, again, it becomes this due, due process free blacklist that they can maintain that is not public. We don't know what it is. Like there's a so in the context of export law, there's a blacklist of people that you can't do business with. But everyone knows who's on that blacklist, and there's a process for removing people if you want to. Um, you know, it's it's this is different because the list itself is a secret, and there's there doesn't appear to be a clear process for removing people's names. Um, Suspicionless searches out of electronics at borders. I, I mentioned before, like back in the 70s, don't let anyone tell you that it's always been that way because it hasn't been that way. Because first of all, people didn't have fucking laptops 20 years ago. And secondly, um, the, so the amount of data that people are carrying with them is completely different from, categorically different from what the way it was before. And secondly, the, the, the rules are, have actually changed. Uh, whether the constitutional issues are the same or not, the rules have been radically modified. Uh, so that so that um, you know the the, the customs uh, agents can they can actually physically destroy things that you that you own in, in, without suspicion without any reason to think that you've done anything wrong, sir. Your old argument that uh, gas tanks have gasoline. That's right. That's right. Gas tanks. Have, so so right. The the case where they physically destroyed something was uh, where they put, somebody had a bunch of weed in their in their gas tank in their car. And so they drilled in, somehow they knew, they, they claimed that they had no reason to suspect that this person was doing anything wrong, and they randomly decided to drill into their gas tank, and lo and behold, there was weed there. Uh, and so maybe they knew because the NSA tipped them off. Who the fuck knows? Um, but the, uh, you know, their argument was that, that we can drill into people's gas tanks without suspicion. And the court upheld this, uh, and their argument was, well, typically people have gasoline in their gas tank, and if it so happened that the customs agent saw your gasoline, that would not be a significant privacy incursion. So it's really not that big of a deal. And I think that, that, that I can accept that, that conclusion, but the problem is that people have interpreted that conclusion as being sort of like a, like a um, uh, you know, the gate is now open for any kind of destruction of any physical property in the context of crossing the border because there could be no privacy consequence that would matter. Uh, and that sort of rationalization, I think, is, is extremely uh, dangerous, but that is exactly what people have, have done as a result of that case. It's like, we're good, let's go! Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it may be the case, it may be that the precedent that, that established this issue is fine, uh, but what people are doing in, re in response to that precedent is, is, is deeply troubling. Um, uh, warrantless wiretapping. So we had this whole debate about warrantless wiretapping during the Bush administration. Uh, and I'll come back to it in a minute. Uh, but um, it's, uh, you know, I, I thought the problem was solved, wasn't it? Didn't they solve that problem? Um, you know, maybe they didn't. Uh, uh, and business record surveillance. Um, you know, we knew that, so for example, we knew that everyone who checked into a hotel over the course of New Year's Eve a few years ago in Las Vegas, all of their names and addresses were sent to the FBI for processing. So there's big, Examples of business record collection that, that, that have been publicly disclosed, but I don't think anyone appreciated the, the business record, like the idea that, so the, the law says that they're allowed to collect records if those records are relevant to an investigation. And everyone's interpretation of relevance before was that, that the business record actually had to be in some way relevant. Uh, and, and the NSA's interpretation is that if they need the business record, it's therefore relevant. And so they're not allowed to collect things they don't want to collect, okay? But anything they want to collect is therefore relevant, and then they can, uh, uh, which is, um, uh, you know, a, li a little bit uh, uh, unreasonable. But nevertheless, it is the policy that they're operating under. So you brought up another point. What did you bring up that I forgot oh, to list drones. here? Drones. Drones. Kill us. Kill, yeah. Obama kill us. Okay, so there's a very good uh, policy analyst named Benjamin Wentz who works at the Brookings Institution, and he runs a blog called Lawfare. Uh, and I will mention him later. Um, uh, but on Lawfare, there is a post about the drone rationalization. The rationalization is that, that it's there that, that these people are in a place where they cannot be reached uh, through other means 
um, and, and, and there is some imminent risk that they are going to attack the United States. So oh, yeah. that's, that's the story. Um, it's not, they have not argued that they can drone anybody they want, whatever they want. They have argued that there's the specific, there's three prongs, I don't remember the third one, but there's, there's the context in which they can do that. And, and it, they, you have to be in the mountains of Afghanistan somewhere, and you have to be an imminent threat to the United States, and some other, there's some other prong. Um, and, and so it's, there's been a lot of advocacy about this issue. Um, a lot of people are concerned about what happened, um, but you, you know, the, the, the actual legal rationale they have, uh, you know, you, you, it's, it's not, it's not, the, the question is really whether, whether their definition of things like imminent threat are the same as ours, and that's really where it gets dicey. They, they talked about how um, there's, the, they're, they're changing the definition of imminence, they actually said that. So, you know, the word imminence does not mean what it means to you. The word relevant does not mean what it means to you. There's all these words that they keep using, but it turns out when you dig beneath the surface, the definition of the word they're functioning on is not the definition that everyone understands that definition to be. And that is a kind of doublespeak that is deeply uh, troubling when it comes to these issues. It's like we've all agreed on a policy, but in fact, my, my understanding of what we've agreed to is not the same as everyone else's understanding of what we've agreed to. So it's a way of lying to everyone. You've missed a huge one. Okay. Uh, the secret interpretation of the uh, of the Patriot Act. <laughs> well, that comes back to business records surveillance. Doesn't Not exactly. It? Okay. Uh, you keep going. I'll, I'll come up with a solid okay. reason, but it, it it deals with individuals also. So so there's two uh, consequences. So first of all, actually before I go on to that slide. I just want to make the observation that I think that there are a great deal of changes that have happened over the past 10 years that have a significant effect on, on, uh, on, on civil liberties. And so when I talked about how civil liberties on the scaffolding that hold, hold up in the space that allows communities like this to exist, um, you know, I feel threatened. You know, I don't feel threatened because I'm Al-Qaeda. I feel threatened because I'm somebody who stands outside of what is normal behavior. And, and I, I see the value. I understand the value of doing that. Um, and and I, I think that that is why this community is upset about this. Uh, and it's, it's uh, you know, the reality is that this has consequences beyond the government's ability to investigate terrorism. And I don't think that the, the establishment really appreciates that those consequences will hurt them as well as they hurt us. So, so this is a chart that, so there's this, who's this guy? This guy writes, who runs uh, 5830? You guys know this guy? I forget his name. He's this guy who like got into sports statistics. He was really good at sports statistics. Nate Silver. Yeah, Nate Silver. One of the most astute analysts of our political scene today. This guy was into sports statistics and predicting the outcomes of sporting events. And then took, took that knowledge and he applied it to uh, predicting politics. And he, he, was, he had very accurate predictions for the previous election. Uh, so he's, he's definitely a force to be reckoned with, and the establishment doesn't like him because he because everything he does is data-driven and it doesn't facilitate a narrative. Uh, it's just sort of like factual. Uh, and so, and so where, where, for example, in the previous election, there were a lot of people who desired the idea of this, this, this close contest between Obama and um, uh, Romney. In fact, like the, the, the likelihood of Romney winning that election was quite narrow. Uh, and the data showed that, and that was not something that the media really liked because it didn't, it didn't create a controversy. It wasn't interesting. It was like, oh, it's done. Uh, and so, um, you, you know, I, I, people don't like truth. Um, so anyway, that's right. Uh, so, so he did this post right after uh, the Edward Snowden revelations. And this post, this chart is how people in the U.S. House voted about the Patriot Act extension in 2011. And you can see that there are basically four quadrants uh, of people in the House. There are establishment and anti-establishment congresspersons, and, and there are left and right congresspersons, and they broke down more or less on the basis of those lines. And this is, this is what I'm getting, getting to. Like, so back in the you know, five, six years ago when, when Bush was wiretapping people, there was this clear partisan divide. Where you know the liberals were up in arms about those damn Republicans and their 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 civil liberties violated, and then the Republicans were lined up behind their man and he's got to fight terrorism and you know uh, you know he's doing it right, uh, and it was this clear partisan divide. But now that it's Obama doing the wiretapping, we have a completely different set of reaction from people, and it's it's actually broken up into quadrants. So 
you know, the, the, we still have the, the same guys that are lining up behind Bush are, are more or less lining up behind Obama. They're, they're consistent at, uh, you know, uh, proponents of state authority. So you have these, these establishment conservatives that, that support surveillance no matter who's doing it. And then you have, but you also have anti-establishment conservatives. So these are people who supported Bush when he was doing the spy, but they're opposed to Obama doing spying uh, because they don't like Obama. Um, because he's a liberal, so you 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 kind of have this this other quadrant of the conservative party now that that's that's concerned about the surveillance now that someone else is doing it. Uh, the exact same thing is happening on the left. So you have these liberals who um, you know were opposed to spying when it was Bush doing the spying, uh, but now that Obama's doing the spying, it's fine because he's on their side. So these are establishment uh, establishment liberals. Uh, you know, who, the Nancy Pelosi's of the world who are arguing that, you know, a Bush, Bush's spying was bad, but Obama's spying is fine. Um, and, then you, and then you have anti-establishment liberals who are opposed to spying no matter who's doing it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, they were, they were opposed to spying before and they're opposed to spying now. Um, there are things that they're not opposed to that they probably should be, but I'll get into that in a minute. So, so this has been the way that this is broken down, um, and it's it's caused some interesting um, uh, uh, you know arguments to be made. You, you know, the, the arguments being made by the establishment conservatives are not that interesting because we've been hearing them for ten years. It's like you know, government power, good government, whatever. Um, the 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 arguments of the of the establishment left are a little bit more interesting because we haven't been hearing them before, and now we're hearing them. And the rationalization is that what Bush was doing was illegal, but what Obama is doing is legal. Uh, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, what Obama is alleged to have done is much more um, uh, uh, intrusive than anything that was alleged about Bush while Bush was president. Uh, so what we, the debate that we had when Bush was president was about um, the surveillance of, of international telecommunications between people in the United States and known terrorists outside the United States and whether or not a warrant was required to do that kind of surveillance. So it really was a technicality. Everyone agrees that the NSA should be, almost everyone agrees that the NSA should be spying on communications between Americans and people who are known to be terrorists. That's, that's understood to be okay. Uh, the question is whether or not they followed the process to get a warrant when they were doing that. And if they're not following the process to get a warrant, like are there additional phone calls that they're sweeping up that, that don't actually fit that description? So that's a pretty narrow debate. Uh, what, what Obama is accused of is spying on all of you and every single person in the United States, all innocent American citizens. That's, that's a completely different thing. It's categorically different. It's got a much broader scope, and it's, it's, it's a greater concern, ultimately. Uh, and so if you were pissed off as hell that, that Bush was not getting warrants for his targeted surveillance of terrorists, you know, four or five years ago or whatever it was, you ought to be pissed off that Obama is spying on everyone in the United States. Furthermore, the argument that Obama, what Obama is doing is legal is, 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 um, is, is highly questionable, and I have this list of, of, of people who are raising questions about that. Um, uh, uh, one of them, and I, I, it just infuriates me when I see these people who are like, Obama is not breaking the law. Um, so Jim Sensenbrenner is the guy who wrote the Patriot Act. Uh, uh, and he says, um, you know, that, that, uh, you know that, that I authored the Patriot Act and this is abuse of the law. Um, he filed a, a, a FOIA request uh, on the ACLU's lawsuit over this issue a couple weeks ago. And he said that he was not aware of the metadata surveillance when he reauthorized the Patriot Act in 2011. And what, if he was aware of it, that he would not have voted in favor of doing so. So you have a congressman arguing that he was lied to, and he would not have voted for the legislation that he voted to if he knew the truth. All right? Um, so, so, you know, um, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Uh, um, Orrin Kerr is, a, is a, uh, one of my favorite law professors on the planet. He's an expert on the Fourth Amendment, uh, who writes eloquently about it all the time. Um, and, you know, he said it was surprising and troubling if the law was being interpreted in the way they are apparently interpreting it, and has continued to criticize the way that the government is interpreting these things. Uh, so I mentioned Benjamin Wentz, uh, who, who supports the drone program, okay? So certainly not a left-wing liberal. Uh, Benjamin Witt says, it is simply different in grander in scope and scale from anything that we had thought the law meant, which is a very nice qualified way of saying it's fucking illegal. 
All right? Um, and again, you know, not a left-wing liberal saying something like that. This guy is, is uh, and certainly a highly qualified expert on national security policy. And of course, so, you know, Jennifer Granick and, and Christopher uh, Sprigman are, you know, Jennifer Granick works for the EFF, so we know what side they're on, right? So you can, you can discount them if you want, but they, they, they uh, um, have been very clear that no uh, statute explicitly authorized mass surveillance. So if your opinion is that Obama did not break the law, there's a lot of very smart people from across the political spectrum that do not agree with that, and they know what they're talking about. Was there a question? Uh, did you already go across the, uh, the, uh, the part where you explain how we get the government to follow their own laws? No, because I don't know what that is. Um, Let's so the, it worked last time. The, <laughs> the, the other side of this coin that, that is kind of frustrating me is the anti-establishment laugh, and that is um, that, uh, so the other side of this coin is, so clearly there's some, been some things revealed here that the government was doing that they shouldn't have been doing. Ha, but, but people want to have this narrative be not about what the government did, but about Snowden. And I, I actually don't give a fuck about Snowden because I didn't vote for him and I'm not in control of his actions. It doesn't really matter. I care what the government did because that's the institution that we're, you know, all inherently a part of. Um, you know, if, if Snowden turns out to be an asshole, it doesn't really matter. Um, but, the, but, the, but everyone is concerned about whether this guy is a hero or a criminal. And I, and I don't think it's hero! that simple. All right. Well, I, I, I don't think it's simple. Criminal. I think he did certain things hero. that were useful. Criminal. I think he also That's disclosed other exactly. things that he probably shouldn't have disclosed. So consider the PRISM program. The PRISM program is exactly what you would have expected if you understood federal policy. Yes, they're going to Facebook and getting the Facebook accounts of people who are suspected to be terrorists. And you would expect Facebook to be collaborating with them to do that. Uh, and, and the problem is that the chart shows which social networking sites they have strong connections with. So if you want to avoid, if you want to make it hard for them or expensive for them to spy on you, you can choose to use a site like Meme Streams uh, that there that wasn't on the Prism chart. Uh, so uh, um, yeah, it's a little shameless. No, I'm just kidding. So um, I, I would fold like a house of cards if the NSA showed up at my house and wanted someone's Meme Stream. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, thanks, Paul. <laughs> At least he's honest. I'm just kidding. Oh, why do we have problems if someone is opinionated as you will fold for them? They have guns. I'm just being sarcastic. So, so the um, so I mean, basically, if you're a terrorist, you 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 should not use Facebook. You should use some little social networking site that didn't show up on that list. And that information is useful to those people. So clearly, by disclosing it. Snowden helped them to a certain extent. So it is it is reasonable for people to be angry at Snowden, but at the same time, he disclosed things that the government is doing that they shouldn't be doing, and it's reasonable to be angry at the government for that. It is possible to both love and hate Edward Snowden at the same time, uh, but people, people don't, they can't process that. He must either be black or white. He must be good or bad. Uh, and, and uh, you know, people cannot... Um, you know, comprehend the idea that human beings are complicated and they, they do things that are both stupid and noble. People that are married should understand. My wife has learned many things from our relationship. Um, <laughs> I certainly am capable of doing things that are both stupid and noble. Um, so, uh, you know, I. I See something, say something. <laughs> something it goes on turning your neighbor. Yeah, yeah. It Make goes on yeah, yeah. in two-tier justice system. That, that, yeah, so I, I'm really concerned about this Edward. So this so there's two problems that have occurred. I'm actually getting ahead of myself. One of them is that all conspiracy theories are now true, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I told you so. Everybody, <laughs> just say it. Every so sinful honestly, say it. Just say it. I'm gonna get there. So, <laughs> honestly, like, 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 so, so there, there's all these people who are like, you all knew the NSA was spying on everybody. Why are you acting so surprised? And it's because under, in good company, one did not admit such things, okay? Uh, previously, there were all kinds of people who alleged this kind of stuff was going on. There were a lot of people who believed that it was true, but nobody had any proof. And so a proper company, one did not admit that such things were going on. Uh, and, and now there is proof. And so that guy that you might have dismissed as a wacko conspiracy theorist said, ah, oh, that's not really happening. That's just crazy shit that someone heard on our bell. But well, it really turns out it's actually real. It's true. It they turns screwed out up and said, no, he's not just a conspiracy theorist, but they did it. Yeah. 
They admitted they yeah, lied. Yeah, no, you're right. They should never have admitted it. They should have just right. dismissed all of it. But they, but they bought, but they said that it was true. And so the problem is that every other crackpot out there who says that, so for example, on the one hand, if the government, or if someone revealed that there actually were aliens in Area 51, there would be someone making the argument that we have no right to be angry because we all knew that there were aliens in Area 51 the entire time. And so there's no reason for anyone to be shocked by this. What the fuck is the matter with you people? Um, so, so, you know, on the other side of that coin is that, in fact, um, you cannot dismiss the guy who says that there are Area 51 in this, or a aliens in Area 51 in the exact same way that you might have dismissed him six months ago, okay? <laughs> Six months ago, all these things were crazy conspiracy theories, but now you gotta say, oh, I don't know, dude, you might be right about that. And so, yes, when I said that aliens were going to eat everyone at Freaknik, you know, <laughs> you can't dismiss that anymore, right? That's the bottom line. It's entirely possible that that's going to happen, and now you can no longer dismiss me as a crackpot. Because all these other crackpot theories have been proven to be true. I don't think that's how that works. <laughs> Even a broken clock is right twice a day. I'm not a doctor, but... Only it's analog, digital, digital ones just don't show nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Playing analog. I'm a doctor, Jim, not a conspiracy theorist. Uh, yeah. So, so that was... I, I said there were two problems. One of them is all the conspiracy theories are now true. The other one is that is that they made it very clear that there is a two-tier justice system. Okay, so you have this guy uh, James Clapper who said that you know um, who was asked under oath in in the in the Senate if they were spying on everyone in the country, and he said not wittingly. Not wittingly is what he said. Not wittingly. And I mean, he might be a great guy. He might be an excellent public servant. He might, everything he's doing might be really really useful. But he fucking lied under oath in front of everybody, and it's really clear that he did that. So you have to prosecute him. The, 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 so they had this guy, Roger Clemens, guy, a baseball player. He said under oath, when no one was paying attention, that he didn't use steroids, okay? And they prosecuted him for it. Now, he beat the rap because he's a millionaire, and that's how you get out of, you know, that's another aspect of our multi-tier justice system. If you're rich enough, you can get out of whatever. But, you know, the fact is that they prosecuted him. They have not prosecuted James Clapper, and they're not going to. And, and again, you know, I, I feel bad for James Clapper. He was in a bad position, you know, whatever. He, he did what he could do. But the reality is that, that if, if, we don't, if we don't prosecute him, we are sending a very clear message that, yes, there is a two-tier justice system, and the rules that apply to Roger Clemens do not apply to James Clapper because he is one of us. <laughs> so, so, I mean, the reality is that you know, a lot of, not only are all conspiracies uh, real, but the whole concept of, you know, a lot of people felt that the system was unfair, but now you have proof. You have proof. You have proof that Obama is a liar. So, do you, do you, do you, who are you going to vote for? If you, if you were pissed off about this stuff before under the Bush administration, like I was, okay, come on, I, I, I talked about it a lot here. And you voted for somebody because you thought that they would do a better job managing that? Like, there's somebody who said that they were going to do so? And then it turns out that that was all bullshit. You know, Obama cannot run for office claiming to be a Democrat and then get into office and say, you know what, I caught up this morning and I was thinking that I've decided I'm a Republican, you know, and, and just can proceed to govern as a Republican for the following four years. That's not how this fucking works. Normal people like you and I, we can change our minds. We have the right to change our opinions. But when you get elected by the people under a, a platform, you're, 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 you're responsible for what you told people you were going to do. But the Supreme Court has ruled the campaign pledges are protected speech. They have. Tom, why did you re-elect him when he was up for re-election? Something about 47%. It's a long story. Um, <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, if Obama had changed his mind and said he was a Republican, he would be honest. And I, our political system isn't based on honesty, it's based on deceit. I, 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 I see no choice but to vote for a libertarian in the last election, personally. Should have voted last time for libertarian. Perhaps I should have. <laughs> All the criticisms are fair. <laughs> But the, the issue is that, that, that um, you know, I, I, I just, I, I don't think these guys have any credibility anymore. And it, again, before, no one, no one really trusted them, 
but it was this sort of polite society thing where everyone thinks they're full of shit, but they vote for them anyway. But now, now it's actually out in the open that they are in fact full of shit, and, and you can't really deny it. It's, it's proven that they're full of shit, so what are you gonna do? And I think what Nate Silver was saying with this chart is that he's actually predicting that there will be significant political consequences associated with this. That some of these third parties will uh, be surprisingly more vibrant in the next election cycle as a consequence of this. Um, and, and it remains to be seen, but I, I think that, that more or less that's what he's saying, that this, this, is, this has opened a rift in our, in our political uh, world that, that was not visible before, that was, that was shrouded under partisanship. Um, and so, you know, be that a good thing or a bad thing or whatever, I, I think that, that he'll go. You know, it either will have consequences or it won't, and if it has consequences, it'll have these kind of consequences, where I'm going to stand up and I'm not going to be mic'd, but this distinction that, will matter more than this one. That, that mic is portable. You Use your technology, Tom. <laughs> I'm too drunk. <laughs> All right, so, 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 fucking crunch. <laughs> they they monitored the content of every text message and email that was sent in the city of Salt Lake during the Olympics in 2002. Hey, that was Mormons. I bet that was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, they probably have an algorithm for figuring out who's like married, and it probably just didn't work in that city. It was just... <laughs> Either his wife has eight cell phones or something is wrong with our algorithms. <laughs> Sorry, I know I'm a jerk. That was the same year that Greece found out all their politicians with their bones were compromised. It was that was a different Olympics because I think it was the following Summer Olympics were in Greece or the earlier Summer Olympics. I don't remember which year. They haven't come up to that one yet. Salt Lake City was winter. What? No, what I'm saying is the Greece thing was summer. Greece was 2004 summer. Okay, so yes, that would have been the following Summer Games. So, so perhaps, that's very interesting. That's a very interesting observation. Because now we're saying that we surveilled the shit out of the, the Winter Olympics in 2002. And we know that there was some shit that went down with surveillance in 2004. To the point where the tech committed suicide. Yeah, the tech committed suicide. Or, or, or he was murdered. Allegedly committed suicide. Remember, all conspiracy theories are now confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> Elvis and Tupac said so I, that, that's an interesting observation. <laughs> it increases the likelihood that, you know, we had something to do with it. With Paul? When we had a debate about surveillance during the Bush administration, we talked about this narrow program. And it was a problem because they weren't respecting the law. It was not a problem because of what they said they were doing. What they said they were doing is spying on communications with known terrorists, which is fine. The question is, how do you establish that you actually know that that person is a, is a terrorist, and did you do it to some standard of law, and do you have some check and balance that makes sure that you did so? Those things are important, but what they fundamentally underlying thing that they said they were doing was not really the problem. The, the, it, was, it was whether or not the, the Bush administration really respected the rule of law was the issue. Okay, this is a totally different, categorically different kind of thing. And this is, the Fourth Amendment clearly prohibits this, okay? There is no way on the fucking planet that this is, that this is legal. This is broad-based surveillance of the content of Americans' communications. None of the rationalizations for the NSA surveillance program that Edward Snowden revealed apply to this, okay? This is off the fucking reservation. And it's and it's and we did not have a debate about this during the Bush administration. We didn't talk about this and decide that it was resolved. So all these people who are like, well, we had this debate about more or less wiretapping during Bush, and everyone knows that Bush was engaged in more or less wiretapping, and it's water under the bridge because it's all dealt with. Bullshit. This this was never discussed. I keep hearing it wasn't discussed, but it did exist. I keep hearing this argument just like that it's okay to collect the data if they don't He's look at you. <laughs> and that seems like no, pointless sir. argument. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if the, if the computer looks at the data... So first of all, they were arguing that they did not collect the data before. Now they're arguing that they do collect the data, but they're not looking at it. Do you trust them? <laughs> well, no. It goes further. It's like they can only look at it if they're closely supervised, and then it's... 
We, we always find out when they look at it and they're not no, close no. to supervised, and we even have a term for it when they spy on their, you know, yeah, their I, girlfriend. Oh, yeah, love I it. Claim, right, right. Love, love it. Yeah. 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 I claim as soon as they collect the data, yeah. it's fine. It doesn't matter if it's a like looks at it. So th this was an argument that was actually made by Richard Posner, who's a um, appellate court judge, a very influential one, someone who would be a potential Supreme Court justice if he wasn't such a loudmouth. Um, and he, he wrote this opinion back in 2006 that said that if a computer reads your email, then that's not a violation of your privacy because a computer doesn't care about your underwear. That a computer is only interested in evidence of a crime. And so the, he, he basically created this whole rationalization that, that computer-based searches weren't a violation of privacy. Um, that if computers read your email, or listen to your phone calls that, that you might not fear this because it's just the computer and the computer is emotionless. Uh, and, and that if the computer found enough information in scanning your email or listening to your calls that it thought that it was worth elevating to a human, then that created a standard of suspicion. And so now we're not doing suspicionless uh, surveillance. The sur active surveillance happens when the human gets access to it, and at that point it's been filtered by the machine. That's so bootstrap. This was an argument I made, uh, Freaknik. Um, and, okay, here's my prediction uh, that I made in a previous Freaknik that is now coming true. I predicted that robots would be breaking your house and searching through your property uh, because you have no expectation of privacy with respect to robots that search your house. Okay? And it's exactly the same rationalization. But. We're just waiting for a drone. Just say it. Just say it. <laughs> Aliens? No. No, they, I told you so. Yeah. I told you so. Yes! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers! So yeah, I mean the bottom line is that the bottom line is that is that I don't know who the fuck to vote for anymore. I'm really, I'm honestly pretty dejected because obviously no one gives a fuck about the Constitution. I mean, come on. And, 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 thank you, thank you, sir. Cheers. Hey, hey, no, no, no. Thank you. I give a fuck about the Constitution, but my establishment does not. They see it as a, as a, as a bureaucratic. They see it the same way I see their fucking like, you know, their their forms I got to fill out. They see it as this formality that they got to deal with. They don't they don't deeply understand and respect the reasons that it exists. And and so you know if they if they out of out of the need to do what what they need to do feel that they need to ignore it then that's what they're going to do. And and there's no there's no institution within our system that's going to hold them accountable. They're they're, they're not going to they're not going to charge James Clapper with perjury. And they're not going to. There, nothing's gonna. Nothing's gonna happen. They have this. Um, they have this panel that they put together. That's this like this like you know gold pa star panel of experts who are gonna evaluate whether or not they did something wrong. And on this panel, they put two uh, national security hots. One of them's Richard Clark, who many of you may have read before. Um, you know, he's a cybersecurity guy, but he's obviously not like a civil libertarian, right? And then they've got. Um, they got this guy. They got this guy who's a liberal paternalist. Okay, and that is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> Somebody thinks that the government ought to, no. ought to yes, no. ought to, yes, no. yes, no. ought to, ought to direct you to intelligent choices that you can make for yourself. Yes. This person is a law professor who really believes. He's exact. He's he's like Rush Limbaugh's like conspiracy theory materialized. Okay, he's somebody who really believes that the government is there to sort of parrot you along and like set you on the right track and pat you on the head and tell you what to do. Like that's genuinely, that's what he thinks. Was Matt the lobby for it? Was Matt the angle for it? American Sea Health. His wife, incidentally, is the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Um, the the. Um, and so, so yeah, Cass Dustin, and then, and then you've got this guy who, who's this is interesting. He's a law professor at a university in Illinois. He's a big Obama booster. Has already gone public with the idea that Obama again did not break the law. You know, because everything Obama is doing is legal. But that Bush guy, he was a criminal. Um, you know, and and uh, and so uh, he's he's gone public with that point of view that everything's fine and there is no problem, which is clearly why he was appointed to this gold star panel to review. You know what I'm saying? So the problem is that he's on the ACLU's advisory board, and so the ACLU. It's funny because he's actually made public arguments that the ACLU is arguing against in court with respect to this issue. 
Um, but because he happens to be there, and, and it's fine, their advisory board can have a, 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 you know, a bunch of divergent views. They want different perspectives. They want somebody to tell them that they're being too radical. So you know, perhaps they have him on their advisory board for that reason. But you know, it, makes, it gives him the appearance of being a, a civil libertarian when he in fact is not. Uh, and, and so uh, you, you know, there, there is only one person on this panel that I think will provide a reasonable point of view, and his name is Peter Swire. Um, Peter Swire was active uh, on the, on the um, border search issue, uh, and he is actually the author of this thing called IAPP. How many of you know what an IAPP certification is? It's the International Association of Privacy Professionals. So if you want to be like a chief privacy officer at a company, and it's actually funny from the computer security perspective, most of it, you don't have to be a lawyer to get it, but most of it has to do with teaching lawyers how to do computer security. So most of the people in this room could probably pass the certification quite easily and get a job as a chief privacy officer somewhere. Uh, but it has to do with what the laws are that, that, have, that constrain the use of private information, which many of you probably understand inherently very well. Uh, so he wrote the, 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 the test material that you have to learn in order to get that certification. So he's, he's definitely a credible privacy expert and, um, you know, is concerned about government overreach. So of the five people, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading his minority report from this panel. Uh, you know, so, so that's, their, that's their gold star uh, uh, that they're going to put on themselves, that they did everything right. Um, and, and, you know, things are just going to go on. So. You know, I, I just I'm I'm really dejected because I I think that some of these principles are important. I think that we have institutions in this country that try to uphold them, like the Supreme Court, and and you know in this case it's more or less been revealed that we don't care. And so and so that again, all conspiracy theories are true. All apathy is now reasonable. All cynicism, you know, is now is is now you, you know mainstream. It's 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 the way that that we need to think about things, and and that's that's very disheartening to me. Um, so the, the only thing that I can I can argue is is not disheartening is this, and and this is this is something that Aesthetics posted on his his Twitter feed. So if you're listening out there, Aesthetics, thank you very much. Um, and it, it's these are things that the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court has declassified since Edward Snowden's um, uh, disclosure, uh, and and it is a ton of material about the actual proceedings of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, which were not available to the public before. So if anyone tells you that this hasn't had a consequence from a legal standpoint, they're full of shit. It has had huge consequences. It has made the process more transparent. It has allowed us to have more visibility. I don't know if it's really changed uh, what's happening, uh, but at least um, you know, we, we're no longer having the court system dismiss the arguments that are being made on the basis of the fact that it's a secret and we can't talk about it. So maybe as a consequence of all of this stuff coming out, we will reach a point where uh, where, where we actually have a, uh, someone like the Supreme Court deciding that this was not legal. And, and if we get there, then, then that, will, that will be a positive step. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it remains to be seen, and at this point I'm very cynical. So, I don't know, those are my uh, remarks, uh, and, and you, you had your hand up, sir. Uh, FASA has existed since 78 or 79, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, I may be even earlier than that, but yeah, 70s. Sometime in the 70s. And between then and now, have we ever gotten anything out of it? It's always been the behind the black curtain, right? So, so um, let me let me explain a couple of things. So there was so there's two court rulings that you need to understand. One was in the 60s, and one was in the 70s. In the 60s, uh, there was a ruling that. Uh, that, that So this Fourth Amendment does not say that a warrant is required to surveil people, okay? This is very important. The Fourth Amendment does not require warrants. The Fourth Amendment says that you should be secure against unreasonable, unreasonable searches and seizures. And what, what is an unreasonable, what's a reasonable search and seizure? Well, whatever the fuck we decide, all right? It's a fucking loophole you could fly a 747 through. So. So what, is, what happened in the 60s is that the court decided that any search that was performed for an intelligence purpose was presumptively reasonable. And so this is how Watergate ended up happening. Basically, you had this group of people who were basically like, deputized to break into people's houses, listen for phone calls, do whatever the fuck they wanted, because all of their activity was presumptively reasonable. And they, so they, so where this like, came to a head is when they broke into the fucking offices of the opposing political party, which is really where shit gets fucked up, 
okay? That actually happened. And so that's why they fucking tried to impeach Dixon, right? Uh, because, you know, yes, they were breaking into all these foreign powers, and then eventually they got to the point where they broke into their opposing political parties' offices. So, so that's what happened. And, and the, 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 um, so they, they created, so two things happened. First of all, they had a Supreme Court ruling that said that intelligence activity that is targeted at people that are, well, if you're a foreign power, if I think you're a spy that works for the Chinese, that I can spy on you without a warrant. That if you're an American, I cannot, I have to get a warrant to spy on you, even if I'm doing it for national security reasons. So that's a ruling from 1972. In the past three months, I found a guy who's a professor at the Naval War College arguing that that Supreme Court decision was wrong, and it is the inherent problem with everything, that, that you know, our, our system should require a warrant for intelligence activity that's targeted at Americans. There, there are people who really are angry that the Supreme Court requires uh, the intelligence agencies to get a warrant when they target Americans. There, there is a faction that believes that. So, uh, you know, understand that. Um, but this, the FISA court was basically this, the Congress saying that, okay, the Constitution allows the CIA to spy on foreign powers, but we want to create a, a process for that anyway, because obviously it's gone too far. And so that's what that, that's what the FISA court is there to do. It's like, so the so Constitution, so this is where when, when, when Bush was charged with spying illegally, there was this argument that it was constitutional but illegal. So the constitutional idea is that, is that the Constitution doesn't prohibit the surveillance, but there's this law that requires him to get a warrant from the FISA court, and he broke the law. So it's illegal what he did, but it was constitutional. So, so this, the FISA court was created to rein in the intelligence organization and require them to go to a court and say, you know, this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. It's not the Democratic Party headquarters, it's actually Chinese spies, and this is why. Um, and, and so it may be the case that they like approve most of the stuff that goes before them because they're not getting a lot of stuff that's questionable. And it's, but the problem is that clearly in their little secret chamber where no one gets to review what they're saying, they've drifted to the point where they're agreeing to things they shouldn't well, be agreeing to. I, I was just gonna ask you to say, every time you said FISA, Please proceed it with the secret FISA court, please. I, w I will. I will try to remember to do that. Um, the, you know, so so I mean, a lot of people, as a consequence of this, have been talking about how to reform the secret FISA court so that it has better processes, and that is a positive development as well. And so again, I can't say that the, the consequences of Edward Snowden's disclosures have been entirely negative. Some of them have been positive. Um, you know, again, it's possible for people to be simultaneously heroes and stupid. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, it, it, there are things that he, there are consequences of his actions that have been positive. That is an undeniable fact. Uh, and and the, the potential reform of this FISA court to make it a better check and balance on the, the intelligence institutions would be a positive thing. And maybe could restore faith. What I'll tell you is not going to fucking restore faith is our gold star panel of five individuals, only one of which has any credibility with respect to the subject. Okay, <laughs> so you know, I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I remain cynical, but I have some hope. That's that's my talk. Thank you for listening to me. I hope it was interesting. Let's get started. Right. And again, thank you also for your support for our Wiki Voter Guide. And if any of you is really, really deeply interested in the subject and wants to get involved, uh, let me know because. Um, I honestly like have not put enough effort into it, and and uh, I I think that um, there there I think that it has potential, um, and um, you know if you if you have time and you care about the problem, then let me know, and, and uh, I'd be happy to work with you. Thank you. Uh, hey, so I have some experiences that I kind I feel compelled to share. Okay. Are oh, oh, do you want to use the microphone? Topic? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we, we are we are not a. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so I um I turned uh, off. Flip the switch. It's in the top part. There. Hi. Uh, so I used to work doing surveillance. Uh, as my job, and I did that for two years. What do years. you know about? In what, in what context? I did corporate surveillance, so okay. I didn't do the fancy, cool, uh, cool stuff. Me too, buddy. Um, so I wanted. In fact, to, many of the people in the room here do corporate surveillance. I wanted, so that's a different well, subject. I wanted. Well, I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to talk about like the mindset of surveillance because okay. there are some uh, arguments 
uh, for uh, uh, a blasé attitude in the face of surveillance. I don't think anyone here in this room makes, but I think a lot of people have encountered. Uh, for example, uh, the um, like, uh, why would why would anybody uh, spy on me because my life is really boring? And uh, so my experiences doing surveillance are that uh, there are people uh, who really enjoy watching your uh, life, and there are just people who it who it really gets them off, like watching people's uh, private lives, private lives, and I've met people like that. And I also- And they're attracted to that profession. Right, and so when you're doing surveillance, it's really easy to not do anything. If you have a job doing surveillance, you can do fucking nothing and say, well, I didn't see anything interesting. And you can do that- All clear, for, sir. Yeah, you can do that for a long time. And so people that work doing surveillance uh, will uh, will make up things to find. They will. Their jobs are so boring that they will that they will come up with stories and apply them to the things they see because your lives are so boring. And so that way, if they're if they're wrong, uh, they can go to uh, their boss and well, no, if they're right, they can be they can go to their boss and say, look what I found. Look how diligent I am. Look how good I am at surveillance and impress their uh, supervisor with their diligence doing surveillance. And if they're wrong, they can say, well, I was wrong, but at least I documented it in the logs and I didn't do, uh, any, I didn't do anything against our policies. And maybe they find something else uh, like uh, something that ends up getting somebody fired, uh, which I saw, or if it doesn't get somebody fired, it ends up becoming gossip within the surveillance department and negatively impacts people's careers uh, because uh, that gossip ends up going to uh, the uh, leadership in a company and the person in question never finds out that they are being gossiped about based on uh, surveillance about them. And so, uh, and so, so I just wanted to point out that uh, you know when when the when the comment comes up, you know, oh it, yeah, uh, like a, about the uh, the 2002 Salt Lake Olympics, someone said, uh, oh that must have been so hard looking through all those text messages. Well, no, because there are people that are super interested in those text messages and come up with stories about why those text messages are interesting. And so you don't get to decide what that story is. Thank you. Thank you for your yes. remarks. So I think that that. A huge uh, thing that people need to contemplate is the self-perpetuating nature of these things where if your job is to be a surveillance guy, then you have to justify the cost that you have to the system by finding things that are of interest and rationalizing the idea of expanding what it is that you do. Um, just as, so, you know, in a, in a commercial marketplace, people are trying to, to, to you know, build their, their uh, their, their, their companies and grow what they're doing. You know, people who are engaged in this activity are trying to grow it as well. And so there's there's this uh, you know, need to need to uh, you know the need to identify things and to justify and to expand that that has a big impact on on what we end up seeing. This is an argument that was made by uh, uh, some of the reporters at the New York Times who have been tracking this thing over the past decade that. You know, basically, there's a lots of different ways to fight terrorism, but this is the one that we really know how to do well, uh, and and we, we understand how to do it. We understand how to fund it, and uh, you know, we, we, we understand how to articulate to Congress uh, that we that we need to do it. And so that's that's what we're getting. We're getting we're getting surveillance because that's what we're good at. Uh, and and there there may be other things that we're we're not as good at that would be effective as well. Uh, that we're not investing in because it's just not this is not how what we do. It's just not the people that are out there asking for funding. So, ma'am. Yeah, I just uh, I, I told Aesthetics that you were giving him a shout out. Oh, yeah. And uh, he says to tell you to mention nymrights.org, please. Okay. Well, Aesthetics would like me to mention <laughs> nymrights.org. <laughs> Uh, which has to do with your uh, pseudonymity on the internet uh, so that you can uh, participate in discussions online without necessarily having your true name associated with those political discussions in the NSA's database. So, uh, he gave a talk last night. No, he, he did give a talk yesterday, yeah. On the, he phoned it in. Oh, did he? He did, he skyped it in. So, so I worry that this conference, so I, 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 
many of you have seen Real Genius, I hope, right? Oh yeah. So it starts out that someone begins to bring a, a tape recorder to the to the class, and then other people bring a tape recorder to the class, and eventually the professor brings a tape player to the class, and then the guy shows up, and every there's no there's no people in the room, there's a tape player and a bunch of tape recorders, and so with the aesthetics now presenting remotely, uh, you know. Uh, I, I fear that, that eventually this will become a virtual conference. <laughs> <laughs> There's only as long as the beer is real. <laughs> nice. That should be the slogan for Freak Man. <laughs> At least the beer is real. At least the beer is real. <laughs> but uh, one, one of the good arguments against the, well, I have nothing to hide, uh, is yes, it might be boring to you, but like, anyone who knows me knows I'm into guns. Uh, and there was one week where, yes, I took my lunch break, I rent, went down to the store and bought 1,500 rounds of ammo. Terrorist! Terrorist! Which sounds terrorist, like a whole terrorist, lot. Murderer. That was three boxes. Terrorist! Big boxes. Big. Yes. Oh, so. Terrorist times three! Well, it was uh, of, of 22s, which are very small rounds. Were they half off at least? Cop killer. No, this was uh, before this past December, so it was still, 22s were still cheap. Uh, Baby killer! There was a back to school special at Walmart. Yeah. You uh, <laughs> think he's joking! <laughs> It, it was the whole thing of, I owed a buddy some ammo, and I was going to a marksmanship class that required at least 600, and 22s come in boxes of 500. <laughs> but to someone who doesn't know guns, oh my god, he bought 1,500 rounds. That sounds like a lot. We're going to need more than that for the revolution. Oh God, yes. <laughs> yeah, the same idea when a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, Bush is fine and everything. I'm like, here's three words for you. President Hillary Clinton. And that scared the shit out of a lot of them because it's not in its... Sure, it's great if your guy's in charge, but what if somebody that you might not agree right. with their political but opinion it is, it is funny has to see the that. same power? Yeah. Right? And it's funny to see that play out, right? Because you've had it on both sides now. You've got these Republicans yeah. who are okay with Bush surveilling, but you know now that Obama's doing it, they're they're pissed off. And at the same token, you have these guys who are pissed off that Bush was surveilling. But now that Obama's right. doing it, they're like, it's legal, it's fine. Yeah. What are you freaking out about? You know, and it's, it's amazing how partisanship affects people's thinking. Or, or the actual argument, well, Bush did it. The reality is that most of the people involved in this stuff are the same people that were involved in it before. The, the, the political uh, switchover has little consequence. The, the whole issue is related to partisanship. When, uh, when, uh, People will make that argument, I haven't done anything wrong, I don't have anything to hide. Well, just like Nixon wanted to go break into the opposing party's offices, just because they wanted that little, slight, tiny edge to know what their next move was in that chess game that was being played. Anything and everything you do will be valuable if it moves into that arena of partisanship. Even though what you're doing, if you go back to your first thing, is normal, and it's legal, and it's not malicious, but if it's working against somebody else in the partisanship scale, right, yeah. then all of a sudden, you're worth spying on. That's, a, that's, another, that's another line in the sand, honestly. That's a good option. You know, yeah, yeah, it's true. Well, it's like the uh, ingress thing. It becomes the blues and the greens. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. One of the biggest concerns I see is uh, that it shuts down um, people speaking up. I mean, I may, I don't have anything I got to worry about. You know, anybody can talk about. But nobody wants to talk to reporters. Nobody wants to talk to anybody else because you know now we know that you can find out who's talking to who. Right. So, so this this is it. So let me talk about. Can I talk about that for a minute? That's very. Yeah. There's actually like a lot of depth to the observation you just made, and that is. So um, there's this whole Fourth Amendment discussion 
about whether, you know, this is so, like I said, the Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches. And so we have to decide whether or not we think this is reasonable or unreasonable. And, and that's a, you know, there's a lot of wide, there's a wide variety of different opinions that can, that can, that can come under the banner of what you think the word reasonable or unreasonable means. Um, so, so there's, a, but there's another aspect to this, which is the First Amendment issue, which is that the First Amendment um, protects your right to freedom of association. And so, what is it that a metadata database of telephone calls actually is? It's not really your expressions, it's your associations, it's who you're communicating with. And so the question is, is it, can you have a situation where it's possible for the government to collect the database of every person you associate with, but you simultaneously have freedom of association? It's possible to conceive of that, but it's 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 a little it's you're really uh, on the line in terms of in terms of of, of of what you can accept. The generally speaking, with respect to the First Amendment, we have this concept of chilling effects, where you know if, if people are afraid to speak their minds, or you know if I if I don't want to go up to Freak Nick and say what I think because I think there are going to be consequences of that, then that's a problem, right? Even if the even if the things that I'm going to say, I'm not prohibited from actually doing that. If if I'm afraid of speaking my mind, and the political process breaks down because I can't, I, I have to be allowed to be wrong. That's the bottom line. I got to be allowed to come here and say some shit that later on I'm like, yeah, that was bullshit. I was wrong. You know what I'm saying? And if I if I can't do that, if I if I'm afraid of saying something that I later regret. Um, you know, because people are going to come create consequences for me, or if I'm afraid of saying something that is true that I don't regret, but uh, you know, because people are going to create consequences for me, then that 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 limits our ability to have these conversations. And so I thought about it this way: it's like you know, let's say that you know you decide to associate with someone who's involved in a political issue because you you know agree with them, but then later in the future they go and commit some, they take it too far, they become radicalized, they commit some crime. Um, you know, now you're associated with them because you called them, you talked to them, and it's in the database. So if the government decides to start investigating them because they became radicalized and did something crazy, they're going to come up with your name. And so now you've got to think, like, not only, you know, is it okay for me to talk to that person now because of who they are today, you've got to think, five years from now, is that person going to do something stupid? And, and do I really want to be associated with that person five years from now when they do something stupid? And you might decide to self-censor. You might decide, I'm not going to, I'm not going to interact with that dude because I, I don't know where, where he's going to go. You know what I'm saying? And, and that, that has a negative impact on your freedom of association. At this point, you're self-censoring your associations with people because you're concerned about the consequences that could happen for something that happens in the future. And, and I think that that, to me, is, is a clearer constitutional issue with the concept of metadata records retention than the Fourth Amendment one. I think uh, there's a lot of people who have decided that the metadata is not content, and so you don't really have a reasonable privacy expectation to it. And if we accept that argument, which I, I don't necessarily accept that argument, but if we do, that doesn't, that doesn't eliminate this important First Amendment concern, which is that I ought to be able to talk to whoever I want to, and I ought not not have to be afraid of that. So thank you for bringing that up. It's it's a pretty big issue, and there's actually a lot of depth to it. And there's a there's that issue is being adjudicated now. There's there's a there's a there's a court. Uh, one of the so the ACLU is a lawsuit where they filed, and they have a variety of different arguments they've made, and they made that First Amendment argument. So that will get um, considered by the court system through the process. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, the one thing I want to use the mic. Okay. Uh, you had mentioned DNI James Clapper, yeah. and uh, <laughs> when he testified, you know, he said not wittingly, which accounts for perjury pretty much. So, but I mean, is there no senator that would prosecute him? I mean, out of the hundred we have, everyone's like, eh, we understand, no problem. Sorry to bother you. I mean, how could we? How can our elected leaders? They, they don't. I mean, they, they're in bed with their own, of course, which. I mean, there's no accountability. I mean, oh, well, some of your elected leaders are, and some of them aren't. And then you got to ask this other question: Is how much dirt do they have on X Y Z elected leader that isn't? Which is another a serious concern. I, 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 you know, well, right? I guess it's just if somebody can get up there and you know wiggle and squirm and be like, oh, you know, well, we're whatever we're doing is what we want, and the center's like, 
yeah, okay, we agree. No problem. Sorry to bother you. That's a, that's a problem. Like. That, I agree. I mean, and again, like Clapper could be a great guy, and he ended up in a bad situation. It doesn't matter. You you clearly committed perjury in front of everyone in the country. It's very visible. If we care about the rule of law, you have, they have to. The judge can make a decision that you know we're going to slap you on the wrist at the end of the day. But I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm very concerned about the idea that we're just not going to prosecute that because. Well, right, and that's my point. There's, there's no envelope anymore. It creates an yeah. environment where it's okay for the intelligence community to lie in Congress. And that's actually the environment right. they want. That it's okay for them to lie to us. And, and I mean, part of what they do is deception. I understand that this is difficult. Yeah. You know, I mean, the reality is that, 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 that they cannot be completely forthcoming about everything that they're doing. But, you know, the, the, this creates a difficult challenge. And deciding that we're not going to uphold the rule of law is not the right fucking answer to that challenge. To, to go back to the topic of, of what he was talking about, the freedom of association, you bring that into the real world, they're not doing one hop, they're doing two hops. And so you might associate with someone, that person associated with someone else, you don't know this other person, but that's your quote unquote terrorist. Yeah. And now you're, you're dragged in. Yeah. Three, three degrees of separation, I guess, is how yeah. far they said they were going. Yeah. So, but two is absolutely confirmed. You're all one degree from me, and so you're all fucked. Yeah, we're just going to be clear about that. <laughs> um, yeah, on the topic of self censorship, if you're interested in that issue, uh, Wendy Seltzer runs this excellent website called ChillingEffects.org. Yes, yeah, she does. Yeah. Uh, that's a good. That has a lot of good stories about self censorship. It does. You can submit stories to it. And yeah, and you should search that site for the name yeah. Billy Hoffman yeah. if you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting content up there about it. And in fact, I think that my name is also on that website. Um, so, um, a certain uh, electronics manufacturer once tried to sue me. Anyway, sir. Um, so, in I think it was in the fifties when the OSS and the CIA and all that stuff was getting started, they found out that in Indonesia they could get the whole culture, as far as the political leaders going. Um, on, based on blackmail and based on having all these secrets, they said that the whole society would have safes full of documents that would incriminate the other one. And each politician was just sort of pitted against the next based on all these dark secrets that they could each dredge up on the next. And it seems like with what's happened lately that our whole society is it's sort of been turned on each individual to say, we can do that to you based on us storing all your data in, indefinitely into the future. Um, but another thing I think that's very important uh, when we're talking about the Constitution and we're talking about all this stuff as far as you know philosophy of um, government and, and self-governance and this and that is that the uh, the authority of the Constitution resides within the people, and it's very clear that they don't. There's not any authority, including the Navy itself that has every bit of the military under it, that doesn't come from the people giving that government that authority to have that navy and have that authority to go and kill and you know exact justice on behalf of what we feel is right. Um, and I guess I'm just pointing that out as a fact of say, we are self-empowered. We are not someone who has to answer to that because that has clearly gone rogue and it has clearly gone in a direction that is anti-human. And so I'm just putting that. So, so there's this idea that is promoted by certain people that, that is the idea of the unitary executive. The idea that the executive branch, and I mean, there is some truth to the fact that the executive branch needs to be able to engage in intelligence activities. I mean, that's, that's given. And, and, and they may need a certain amount of autonomy and independence with respect to the decision making as far as that's concerned. I, I like to think that we have a system of checks and balances and that are constraints on that sort of behavior. But the, the other side of the coin is the argument that in order to be effective, the executive needs to be more or less independent with respect to those sorts of things. All of that might be fine if the executive was constrained by you, if the executive was genuinely uh, beholden to the people. And I, this goes back to where I started, which is the concern that that our political system has become so dominated by the 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 um, the, the finance campaigns um, that and we don't really have a fair contest where people are making objective choices about who they want in office. We have a situation where people who are well funded have the voice to reach the people, and people who are not well funded are not able to uh, to compete. And so, as a consequence, 
you know, the people that are getting elected are not really being chosen by the people, they're being chosen by the funders. If that is the case, then the funders are really in control. And so, and so again, this, this executive who's supposed to be beholden to the people is not beholden to the people. He's beholden to these, to, these, to these funders. And so these funders are really the ones who are deciding what is and is not acceptable from an intelligence standpoint. They are the ones who will create consequences if they decide that uh, that this that the, that the that the that the executive has gone too far. So I, I might be willing to countenance a certain amount of independence for the executive with respect to intelligence collection, and I agree that's very important. But but my but my concern is that we we simultaneous to all this debate about about civil liberties and intelligence collection is this other problem that we have where it's not entirely clear that the political leadership that we have is it's beholden to the people. And that, and that problem is it's really at the heart of, and that's where Lessig is talking about root strikers, is really, that is really the heart of the whole issue. And if we felt that the political system genuinely represented the will of the people, then perhaps we would be more comfortable with, it, with, with the things that it is engaged in. Right. And what I'm saying is that we don't have to answer to that, is, is because it's not, okay, sir. Um, what, what I'm saying is uh, that if that, if that's not, beholden to the people the people we are beholden to ourselves you see what i'm saying yeah like as far as that like that's that's something that the entire world is identifying the very key players be it lindsey graham john mccain obama hillary whoever it is that wants to get up there and lie to us that week the entire world is identifying these characters and it's not about the individual people that are out here being forced to you know be divided and conquered every week we are. We have our own interests in mind, and we are going to absolutely show them with a lot of uh, fortitude what our intentions are. I, I hope you're right. I hope that are willing to have some fortitude with respect to this. I hope that people are not. I hope that people understand that that there's been a bunch of bullshit that's been shoved down their throat, and they're willing to say that I don't want to be lied to by these people. That they, that. I hope that people say that they want to be in charge, and it remains to be seen. But Nate Silver, again, is a is probably our, one of our best analysts of political issues in this country today, and he seemed to be implying with this chart that there were um, a new there was a new fault line that was becoming apparent within our political system, and that people were not going to simply lie down and take this, and, and that's critical. You know that that, that people that people are. Um, that people do have enough self-respect that they expect the government to be clear with them about what they are and are not doing, and, uh, and uh, that that and if we are, if we stand up and say that we expect certain things, then we will get them and everything will be fine. But if people decide that that you, you know that they have no agency and that they're powerless, then 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 they will be run right over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's what it's a choice. It's a very clear choice. Right, it's a choice that each person makes. Right. Absolutely. Cheers to that. Prost. <laughs> Alright, are we done talking or are we just we're drinking now? Let's drink. Drink! Yeah. If you were to sum up this last year in four words, what would they be? Holy motherfucking shit. Decius, will you say happy birthday to Nathan? It's his birthday. Holy shit. It's your birthday? Everybody should give him a drink for his birthday. Every day is his birthday. Is this true or false, sir? And not just that, he's getting married. Ah! Game over, man. To a lady. <laughs> That's true. It's not a date. It. Happy birthday to you. Child's birthday, so I'm gonna put a shout out for that, even though he's not here. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Why do you have the mic, Drew? Oh, that was, I'm, oh, I'm being the mic fast. bitch in case someone wants to talk. Oh, okay. Run and hand them the mic. Totally different. We're totally not getting sued. We're gonna get sued for that song. <laughs> we'll edit it out in post. Okay. Good.